AMD's Epic processors get an F? What? Yes. Okay, well, that's kind of clickbait. I'm talking about the F series. There's four of them, four different models. Got the 72F3 and the 75F3. 72F3 is an eight core Epic processor. This is eight cores. There's only eight cores on this processor, and yet it's over $2,500 US. Why does this exist? This is AMD's worst third generation Epic Milan processor. Yeah, third gen, it's a th third iteration. But it's also the best. How is it both the worst and the best? Worst is probably not the right word. Uh, fewest number of cores, that's not actually worst. Uh, but also the highest clock speed, 4.1 gigahertz. The only Epic that can top 4.1 gigahertz, that can top four gigahertz. It is insanely fast, but it's only eight cores. And it's $2,500. Who in their right mind would pay $2,500 for eight cores? Well, there is actually a use case and it opens up a larger conversation about what do you know about your workload and how your workload works? Because in addition to just being eight cores, it also opens up the whole four terabytes of memory or eight terabytes of memory in the case of a two socket system. Or you can get, you know, if you don't need that much memory, you can still support as much memory as you need on the platform in a two socket configuration, just buying more lower capacity memory, which is usually much more inexpensive. So there are use cases. 90% of the use cases around paying $2,500 for an eight core processor are around uh, per core licensing. So it's sort of this thing that's happened since AMD started packing 64 cores in per socket. The most famous example is probably VMware, the virtualization software when you're using their, their whole vSphere suite. Uh, you're in a situation where 32 cores counts as one, but 64 cores counts as two. I guess we're in a, in a place where, you know, Moore's law is like computing power doubles about every 18 months. Okay, well, that's not really exactly Moore's law, but you know, computing power doubles roughly about every 18 months. Uh, we also want the software licensing cost to double about 18 months along with that. I mean, that's kind of what some of those licensing changes feel like. Microsoft SQL Server, that 7763 server, the uh, in the Daytona test platform that's on loan from AMD, that is a half a million dollars of software licensing from Microsoft if you were to run SQL Server on it. But I've actually run SQL Server on it and I don't recommend it because the performance is trash. Yeah, even Microsoft support says, uh, you might wanna think about, you know, if you're gonna have a half a million dollars in SQL Server licensing, think about like three or five servers. Don't think about one monster server. You're putting all your eggs in, your, in one basket and if you can afford a half a million dollars for the SQL license for this in the first place, then the hardware cost is trivial. Oh, it's a $10,000 processor. That's a drop in the bucket when you're talking about a half a million dollars in software licensing, right? Right. So what's the deal? I mean, these are still just Milan cores, right? Well, the story gets more interesting and we'll get into this a little bit in a second with the benchmarks. I've done a lot of benchmarking with open benchmarking. So yeah, the eight core is pretty nice, but I've also got the 75 F3. The 75 F3 is 32 cores and this is the highest end F series processor that AMD has. Uh, truth be told, there's actually four of these, eight, 16, 24, and 32 cores. The 32 core is the one that I would recommend over both of the 64 core models. There's a 7713, which is a steal if you need 64 cores. That's mostly research scientists and people doing continuous computation. Uh, people that are doing DevOps, compile, you've got a continuous integration server that's running simulations of uh, Windows and Chrome and Firefox and like che checking, checking web pages and doing automated testing and you know build reports and things like that. 75F3, this is the processor for you. Even over the 7763, the performance per core versus the 7713, this is about 50% faster, 45, 50% faster in my testing in those kinds of workloads because those kinds of workloads don't really scale all that well with tons of cores. The scaling happens in that you're able to service more users. So if you've got a, you know, a DevOps team that's doing a continuous integration build, uh, kind of like the, the open embedded project that we worked on, then it'll scale a little bit better with cores because you've got a lot of developers doing their own stuff and they need their own testing and that makes sense. 
and most of the testing here uh, was done on Linux, but we'll talk about Windows in a second as well. The eight core, if you've got a, a DevOps team of like 10 people and you need the clock speed because you know compiling <laughs> compiling your fancy Node.js application, um, there's not really a huge difference moving from eight to 16 cores in those kind of workloads. Memory, pressure, how much memory you're using, stuff like that can make more of a difference. Those things tend not to be super parallel. Uh, the processor cost is still like $2,500. Um, if you wanted to save a few bucks, you could get the P-series CPUs. Those don't clock as high, and that's maybe another video, but if you're running something that is performance sensitive or latency sensitive, you can't go wrong with the F-series CPUs. At the risk of overgeneralizing, and this is not universally true, but this is mostly true in a lot of the benchmarks that we did, if you look at second generation Epic, that's Rome, for things that scaled really well to a lot of cores, you know, there was a 64 core Rome part. Flagship part, great, still good if you're buying that today. It's still in the market, it's still in the channel today, you can still buy it. Um, for things that went, ran really well with 64 cores, there was a performance improvement to Milan, but it was not, you know, 50%. It was not breathtaking. Um, so Epic 3rd Gen Milan with 64 cores and Epic Rome 2nd generation with 64 cores. If you were already running 2nd Gen Rome, Milan is not really a compelling upgrade for you because your job already runs really well with a lot of cores. If you're moving from an older platform to that, then that makes sense for you. And maybe you want to go with the higher performing Milan part, given a choice of the two, even if Rome is, is a fair bit cheaper just because. The main benefit on Milan is that the periods between jobs or the periods when you're juggling work where uh, lower thread count performance matters or you have you know one job that's basically dominating the whole system, then that's where Milan's performance can really shine. And that's why this 32 core processor is so amazing. You see, it's still eight dies. There's eight chiplets on here. They didn't cut it down to four chiplets. It's eight chiplets. So four cores per chiplet. You have 32 megs of cache per chiplet. That's the big change architecturally, one of the big changes, from Rome to Milan. Having that monster cache and 32 cores available for your job makes a huge difference in performance when you're talking about 32 cores. This is my Gigabyte test system. It's an R282. It was originally designed for Naples processors, that's first generation. Most of the way it is in server land is you get a, an epic server and it can do Naples and Rome and Rome and Milan. But I'm not aware of any that can go from Naples all the way to Milan. It's a two processor system with all of those four lane NVMe in the front. And I'm happy to report eight cores in a system, well, eight times two, 16 cores total, is face melting absolutely face melting. You've got eight channels of memory per socket. You've got all the PCIe connectivity. For a DevOps server for a small team, nothing beats this because it's 4.1 gigahertz and the benchmarks bear that out. Oh, I'm gonna run PHP, I'm gonna compile this, I'm gonna do you know web DevOps and React stuff and the, all the integration testing and all the stuff that runs in the background. You know, Once you do the, the git commit and all of your automated DevOps stuff is running that chews up a lot of CPU because it's basically simulating all the terrible things the users have done over the years. Incredible platform for that. I would probably move up to the 16 core. I don't have a 16 core on hand, but the eight core 4.1 gigahertz is really awesome. Moving up to the 32 core, because I can configure the 32 core with 16 cores, so I can kind of cheat at this a little bit. Moving up to the 32 core, it can handle more users. That's the main difference, is more users can be running more stuff. So I can run the open embedded simulation. There's a link to GitHub if you want to do that and see how the performance is. And that's just basically a full rebuild of open embedded. You're going to simulate toasters and you know convection ovens and TVs that are running open embedded as an operating system and the web browsers and the results of that. And you can see how your application is going to perform. That takes about 45 minutes, an hour, something like that to run through a bunch of tests. With the 64 core system, you're down to about 45 minutes. With the 32 core system, also about 45 minutes. With the eight core system, eh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on what you're doing and what you're testing. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but by and large, uh, that's how the performance shakes out. And that's why they can charge $2,500 for a eight core CPU is because you get eight cores that are the fastest server cores that you can get. You only get eight of them, but they're insanely fast. They're faster than anything else. You might be wondering, what about 
Team Blue. What? We've got a reasonably not super old Skylake system that is uh, based around two 18-core Skylake processors. Well, I've got you covered. Just one second. This is our Gigabyte R181-2A0. This is outfitted with two 18-core processors. Not quite as much memory because it's hex channel instead of 8 channel. And then we've got some NVMe in the front, which I had to get there by modding, but that's okay. So this is the platform for Skylake X and Cascade Lake X. And Cascade Lake is still being sold on Dell. Socket 3647, it's not the new uh, Xeon socket. I've got two 40 cores. There's another video on that coming, the 8380 Platinums. And uh, spoiler alert, the one thread performance on all these F CPUs is far and away. Uh, I feel like Intel's gonna have to respond to that in some way because there's just not anything that really responds to that single thread performance. And you can see that in the benchmarks. It's really, you know, bravo AMD, good job. For DevOps type workloads and integration tests and all that kind of stuff where you're automating Chrome and running through user tests and you're running through your backlog of things that have happened in your knowledge base to support commercial software products, this platform is not bad. The clock speed here is like 2.0, to like 3.6-ish with like the turbo bins. But if you were on this platform and contemplating an upgrade to something like a dual 16 core from dual 18 cores, that would be a massive upgrade. If you upgrade from dual 18 core to dual 32 core, it's like you've moved about four generations worth in terms of performance. If you're on anything older than socket 3647, now's the time to upgrade. You know, even if you're wedded to something else, if you're running like a like a V4 Xeon, now's the time to upgrade. Honestly, if you're running Naples, first generation Epic, now's the time to upgrade because this is such a night and day difference in terms of performance. There's also one other processor that gets kind of an honorable mention, <laughs> and it's a P-series Epic processor, which means that it'll only work in chassis that are a single socket, not dual socket. It's one. It's suggested retail price is $1,337. It's a 24 core AMD Epic part. And you know, if your purchasing manager's like, ah, $3,500, $4,000, I mean the 32 core processor's pushing about $5,000 right now in the retail market. And it's like, wait, I, we can get twice as many cores. Well, it's not, don't do the math like that. There's nothing faster than the 75 F3 in a 32 core configuration. And unless your job really, really, really wants individual cores, get the 32 core, it's gonna be faster. Faster real world, faster snappiness, faster. For heterogeneous workloads, where there's just a bunch of random stuff going on and you're not a research scientist or doing computation, 75F3, that's the one that you want. You could drop down to 24 or 16 cores, depending on what your job is or licensing requirements, or drop down to the eight core, especially in the case of licensing requirements, then yeah, it's kind of like cheating. You can get the performance of a 16 core system, or in this case, like if you had licensed an 18 core system, you could a dual 18 core system, you could easily drop down to a dual eight core system and probably not notice a performance difference. You wouldn't do that to save on your hardware, you would do that to save on your software licensing costs. Uh, the, the better upgrade, generationally, would be moving from dual 18 cores to dual 16 or 24 cores. You move down in the number of cores a little bit, but the performance is through the roof. Well, again, it depends on your job. You have to learn a little bit about your job and how it behaves uh, with different core counts. And if you have a job that you have questions about that you would like me to test or run through, like we did with the Lowell Observatory processing space data, be sure to check out that video, then by all means, reach out, let's work on something. I'm working on a new project with them right now where we're going to process even more data and see how it goes because Epic is ripping through that like a hot knife through butter and it really is an incredible time to be alive. So be aware of the F-Series CPUs. You might not see those in, uh, the retail channel quite yet, but they're there and you should ask for them. And they're really awesome. This has been a quick look at the 75 F3 and 72 F3, 32 cores and eight cores, and uh, simulated 16 core in the middle if you look close enough in the open benchmarking benchmarks. But uh, yeah, nice, it's good stuff. Good job AMD, wow, it's so fast. All right, I'm Wendell, this is level one, I'm signing out, and you can catch me later.